Welcome to Forest Brook. We are God's church, His people. We've always said we exist to love God and love others. Forest Brook is a community of regular people who are becoming more like Jesus. We're following the Holy Spirit's lead, becoming more aware of His presence around us, and joining God's mission to bring heaven to earth. Each Sunday, we gather to be together in the presence of God. We are transformed by Him and share the experience of worship and prayer and communion, listening to God and being sent out to be the church in the world around us. And in this season, we're learning to be the church in a whole new reality. Are you new here? You're welcome here. We're so glad to have you. We have a virtual connect card we'd love for you to fill in. You can find it at forestbrook.ca. Join in however you're comfortable today. It's good to have you with us. Well, hey church and happy summer Sunday. Today we are shifting the attention of our summer series to our changing economy. Hey, remember a couple months ago when the entire world shut down and then it gradually started up again? Well, of course there are many lasting effects and many big changes because of it. 
And as we look around us, some new areas of need have started to pop up. So what is our response here as the people of God? And how do we plant kingdom gardens in this piece of earthly soil? In God's kingdom economy, in God's way, it's sort of like backwards day every single day, right? Jesus is king of an upside down kingdom. He came as a tiny baby to save the entire world. He says that the last shall be first, that the children will lead and that the weak are actually strong. God tells us that when and where we are weak, he's able to make his power perfect in us. Hey, who needs to hear that again today? In your weak spots, God's power is made perfect. So today as we gather, I invite you to together hold this tension between the hard and the light, between hardship and um, suffering and sadness and the tough realities that we face and celebration, and generosity, and choosing gratitude for the goodness of God, because God is in all of those places. So today, we invite you, however you're comfortable, to join with us in worship, and in prayer, in listening to God, and in communion in a little while. Kids, we hope you grabbed your worship pack so that you can find some cool stuff just for you, and gather and follow along with us this morning. Let's go. Let me pray for us. Oh God, your grace is enough for us, and we thank you for that, that it covers all the things. Lord, we come to you in our hard spots and with our weak spots, and Lord, we ask that your power would be made perfect in those areas. God, we worship you today. We ask for kingdom vision to see what you see, even if it's backwards to what we're used to. Lord, meet with us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
We continue to hear the call to pray for our land, just as God called his people to in Jeremiah. Join us now in praying over our collective position, where we've come from, where we are, and where we are going. Let, let, let's start with silence. Quiet your heart and, and your mind and your hands before God. Take a moment to be still and listen. Lord of all, 
Together, we take a look back over our shoulders to see the path you've been leading us down. We see the ways you have been provider, rescuer, shepherd, friend, and king for sustaining and guiding, teaching, comforting, and correcting us. We say with one voice, thank you. Now we take a look right around us. Lord, at this piece of ground we're standing on. For some of us, it feels shaky. Lord, steady our feet. Lord, we ask together for you to come here and to fill this land with more of your glory and goodness. Lord, together we look towards the future. Some, thing, some things we see clearly, some are quite blurry. We ask you, Lord, to lead us. Show us your heart and generosity and kindness. Help us to follow your footsteps. Give us kingdom vision to see your way. Give us courage, Lord. Lead us on. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. This summer, we've been looking at what it is to live our lives in this new land we find ourselves in, this new reality uh, that we are all experiencing together. We talked about how COVID-19, the pandemic, has changed our understanding of what it is to be community, of the church gathered and the church in dispersion. And the last few weeks, we've spent time listening to one another about the cry for social justice, the cry for racial justice, especially coming from our black brothers and sisters, and we've begun to think about how our systems and institutions need to change. Today, and for the next few weeks, we want to think about how our landscape has changed and how we are meant to respond in light of this new economy that we are finding ourselves in. In April this year, when the lockdown happened and the global economy shut down, by the end of April, one-third of all of Canadian workers were receiving government assistance of some kind. And now as we begin to reopen and are, are moving the economy forward, we're finding that there are long-term dramatic changes and effects in our economy and a fallout from that that we're going to need to come to terms with and learn how to, how to live within. In May of 2020, Stats Canada re released a report which said that almost one in five Canadians indicated that they were going to be negatively impacted by COVID-19 to the point where it was going to make it difficult for them to pay their bills. And they warned that there was a coming storm because that kind of economic disruption doesn't just impact people financially, it spills over into all kinds of social ills, into family problems and into social problems and to all other kinds of things. To help us better understand what we're facing, I wanted to draw on one of our own, someone who has a great deal of wisdom, education, and experience in this field. So I've asked Paul Lewis if he would speak to us about what he is perceiving and hearing about the situation we find ourselves in. Paul is an economist by profession a past elder at Forest Brook, someone that we all know and love and respect. So let's turn to Paul and ask Paul what he sees. Thanks so much for joining us. I look forward to um, hearing what you have to say on this. You are an economist and uh, someone who understands these things much better than I do or, or than uh, the average person. So uh, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise on this. So tell us, Paul, um, what's changed in our economy as a result of this pandemic? Sure, Kevin. I, as you said, I am an economist. I've been trained in that in university and spent over 30 years for my career working on economics. And there's two types of economists. There's microeconomists and macroeconomists. And I always get asked, what's the difference between the two? And a microeconomist is someone who is wrong about very specific things. A macroeconomist is someone who is wrong about everything. And I've been doing macroeconomics for, for most of my life, Kevin. And so as we talk today, I will probably stick with the tr tradition of 30 years of being wrong. Um, but let me tell you, first of all, um, it is a pretty bad situation that our economy is in. I'll try and give some perspective on that. This is the worst economic downturn we've had since the 1930s Great Depression. And I'll put it in perspective for you. Usually in a recession, you lose jobs, and it happens over about a 12-month period. For Ontario, 
uh, that would amount to about, about 200,000 lost jobs in a really bad recession. In just two months alone this year, we lost one million jobs in the province. And that takes the level of employment back 10 years ago. So we lost essentially 10 years of job creation over this time period. So that's a, that shows how hard it has been for people in just a very short time period. So where are we going? Well, the shutdown um, uh, that we did came with a plan. The idea was that we would essentially put the economy into a coma. We would just shut it down. We'd deal with the virus through, through the masks and social distancing. And once we got that under control, we would start to reopen the economy. And the government, through its uh, relief benefit for people and the wage subsidy for business, the government would help uh, people tie it over through that time period. And, and I'm kind of surprised at how well the plan has actually gone. And we're starting to see the economy grow again. We've had two strong months of job creation in Ontario and have actually gained just about 500,000 jobs. That's the easy part of, of the recovery. The remaining uh, jobs that are still out there to be gained, that's going to be harder and will take some time. Um, and there's going to be some big challenges that we will face through the fall and into the winter and potentially longer. And I want to highlight just two of those for you. There's many things that, are, that we face. Here's two challenges that we face in particular. The first, of course, is the virus. The path of the economy is almost entirely dependent on how the virus plays out. And if I could tell you what would happen with the virus, both here and elsewhere, then I'd be able to tell you what will happen with our economy. But it's not so simple. And it's one thing that is almost certain to happen, and that is that we probably will face some sort of second wave of the virus. Uh, every major pandemic that's ever happened in history has seen a, a second wave of infection outbreak. And in fact, we're seeing that today in many countries that have been in this process a little earlier than us. They shut down, got things under control, they reopened, and then they've had some second wave uh, infections happen. We will probably experience that as well. Not sure how great those will be. Could be significant enough that we have to start to shut down certain uh, industries or, or be a challenge for our schools. But that's going to be a problem. And this, this virus is so highly contagious. It's going to be a problem until we can get a vaccine that is widely available and, and effective in, in helping us deal with this. So that's going to be um, one big challenge that we face, and it has global implications. Our, our, the Canadian economy in Ontario, we, we exist in a global economy, and so how we perform depends on many other countries. And in many other recessions that we've had, it's only a few countries that have struggles. Other countries are growing and help draw uh, the countries experiencing a recession into a recovery. This time's different. This time we've got every single country dealing with this, and so it's going to be a challenge for us. And even if Canada gets its act together, which we're in the process of doing pretty well, we're still highly dependent on our neighbours to the south, the Americans, to grow their economy. And they're facing some real challenges in terms of that, largely because they haven't got their, um, the virus contagion under control at this point. So that's one challenge that we face that will persist for a while. The other big challenge that will happen in the near term is related to the government support. Um, by design, those programs that the government is helping support individuals and workers, those are, going to, those are going to fade away. And many people are experiencing mortgage deferrals as well from, from their bank or whoever holds their mortgage. Other payments have been deferred. Eventually, uh, those deferrals are going to go away as well. And so what we've done through this plan that the, the government has brought in is somewhat push off the pain that the economy will experience. But those bills are going to come due. And sadly for some people, when the bills do come due, due they may not have a job to be able to help them through that. So it's going to be a, a, a real challenge going forward. And um, there's, there's another challenge that we, are, we face, and that is that every major recession that's ever happened brings change to the economy. Many people want to go back to where we were. They want to go back to January when everything seemed to be doing well and our economy was performing well back then. 
But all the research shows that when you hit a really significant recession, uh, it has long lasting changes and often they come with negative uh, implications for people and for business. And, and we are likely to, to face that. And the simplest way to identify what those changes would be is to look at what's happening already in our economy. The changes that are happening now will probably accelerate in the next year or two. And some of those would be simple things like working from home. My workplace has had a policy for five years in doing that. And so it was very easy for us to move to working from home. My, one of my neighbors, they had a refusal from their company to do this and they got forced into it. So those kind of things will happen at a greater rate. Um, another one would be automation. You, you've probably, when you're shopping, see a lot more self-serve checkouts. There may be more of that in the future. A lot of uh, factories, you may see more robots on the floor doing things. The companies may choose to accelerate to do that. Another thing is, as I said already, we're highly dependent on other countries that we trade with. And trade has been, the growth rates in trade have been slowing over the last 10 years. And because of the nature of this pandemic and the closures that are going on, trade may, sh um, be, may not be a source of growth for us very much going forward. So these are the, some of the challenges that we're going to have to contend with. One of the biggest challenges that I think is out there and that we're going to have to deal with and, and the, 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 the virus will exacerbate, it has to do with wages. Wages for many, many workers have been stagnant for a number of years. And there's a lot of reasons for that that has happened. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. But some of the wage pressure on the downside is going to come from jobs that are lost and gone for good. Even when you do get another job after you've lost yours, the data shows that if you're in the middle towards the latter part of your career, the next job probably pays you less. Mm -hmm. And um, moms in particular who have young children, they're going to struggle and probably be delayed in re-entering the job market and that could put pressure on household finances. And in our young workers and new graduates, they're coming uh, looking for work at a time when there's not a lot out there. So it could be challenging for them and the impacts that they face earlier in their career can extend longer than, than we would expect. And probably the biggest challenge we're going to face individually and as a society is debt. Uh, there's just going to be so much more debt that people are going to face, uh, both in their households, but also especially at the government level. Government has supported the economy through this shutdown time period, and it's going to come at a cost, the cost of a much higher deficit and way, way higher debt. So that's sort of the sense of, of what we're, where we're going and some of the challenges we're facing. And I know it's not exactly an uplifting message, and it's why economics is sometimes referred to as the dismal science. <laughs> yeah, well, I can understand that, uh, Paul. I really can. Um, but but what, what, how can we be preparing for this, how, especially as the church? What, what is it that we should be thinking about, and how can we be preparing for, for what's happening and what's coming? Sure. Um, I've, if I threw out some numbers at you, the size of the problem is kind of overwhelming to think about. Our economy is output, output each year is about $2 trillion in, in Canada. We have 19 million workers. And so when you've got all these major problems that involve billions and billions of dollars and millions and millions of people, it can be overwhelming. You can think, what on earth can I do? And I'm going to try and bring it down to an individual level for things, for one, one key thing, one key thing that I think we can all do to help ourselves and to help others. And that is uh, I, what we learn in kindergarten, Kevin. It's about sharing. Um, we're going to have many people who are going to experience hardships and difficulties when the government support phases out, when the bills come due. And all of us are going to benefit if we can learn to share more and to help others. And I've got some ideas uh, about that. The first thing is just that, just looking and sensing what people need and being willing to help them in simple ways. Could be financial support for a family member, cutting lawns, painting room, providing groceries. Uh, there's many ways to help. One of the things I hear from many, many people, and maybe you're, you're one of them, Kevin, is that during the lockdown, they got to know their neighbors way better. And it's true. I've talked to some people that I, I, I never had even met, but they'd lived there for 20 years. 
so I got to know them better. And maybe knowing them a little bit better helps me figure out how can I help them? What can I do to assist them? Another way that we can share with each other is maybe we can think about having less for ourselves and more for others. Now, I don't know about you, Kevin, but I noticed that I spent way less during the lockdown. And to be frank, I didn't miss a lot of stuff that I would normally spend on. I love to go to bookstores and I will throw money across the counter and take books away and they go in my basement and it's debatable whether I'm going to give them back to you. Sometimes I, those ones go to you, I don't even read them. So I've little things like that and other things, I've spent way less and I've noticed I can get by. And so maybe in our minds we're thinking, how can I share when it's so tight? That's, that, that will be true for many of us. But others, maybe spending a little bit less on ourselves frees up some resources that we can share with others. Those are two simple things. The next two ideas are a little bit harder for us to understand maybe, but also to practice. The third thing is maybe we need to consider about how much we pay for stuff. Maybe we need to pay a little bit more. Let me explain what I mean about that, Kevin. I was raised by scavengers. Uh, my parents went through the depression and they looked to save money every single place they could. In fact, when I was six years old, my father grabbed me, said, come on, we're going for a drive. And we went out to the country, which wasn't a very far ride. He stopped the car, popped open the trunk, spread out some uh, garbage bags, took out a shovel, and just dug some sand out of the side of the road, slammed the trunk down. Sounds like a scene from The Godfather now that I think about it. Anyways, we drove back home. He pulled the sand out with the shovel, said, there's your sandbox. So we were scavenging, saving everywhere, and I've had that mindset my whole life. Dollarama and I, we have a special relationship, okay? But what I've learned is that even though I can get stuff for a cheaper price, that comes with a price. Because the more and more and more I'm looking to save money and spend less, that means there's less uh, opportunities for workers to have decent wages. Mm -hmm. Those companies that provide me everything so cheap, they, have, they can only do so by suppressing wages, keeping them low. And so I need to rethink about what I spend my money on. And in fact, the CEO of Uber, which is that large ride uh, sharing program that exists, he came out this week in the newspaper and he said, we got to think about how can we help our low wage workers. And he acknowledged that there's a real roadblock for him paying more. And that is because I won't pay more for the service. Right. He didn't acknowledge some other things that should be on the table, such as corporate profitability, but maybe that needs to be part of the discussion as well. The, the fourth thing that we will need to think about in terms of sharing is, could we be willing to pay higher taxes? I've said before in, in our chat that government debt is going through the roof, and it's true. There was a big report today uh, from Ontario and their deficit doubled. It's going to add billions and billions of dollars to, uh, to the debt. And eventually, the bills for debt come due. And I know we hate paying taxes. It's just been ground into us from around the mid-80s that we should never have to pay in taxes. In fact, we should be paying less. But we're in such extraordinary circumstances. The government has stepped in and that's all of us. The government isn't just some abstract group of people. It's all of us. Government stepped in and has really provided a lot to keep the economy going. And that bill is going to come due at some point. And so maybe we need to consider that we might have to expect less from the government and be willing to offer more. And, and people my age, the baby boomers, really need to hear that message. Because if we don't address that, it's just getting offloaded to our children and to our grandchildren. So let me end with a quote. I came across and it maybe speaks uh, uh, about today. The quote goes like this. This is a nightmare which will pass away in the morning. For the resources of nature and people are just as productive as they were. The rate of our progress towards solving the material problems of life is not less rapid. We are as capable as before of affording everyone a high standard of life and will soon learn to afford a higher standard still. 
But today, we have involved ourselves in a colossal muddle, which we do not understand. The result is that our possibilities of wealth may run to waste for a time, perhaps for a long time. That was written in 1930 by the economist John Maynard Keynes, and it's still applicable today. Yeah, we're in a big problem right now, but people are resilient, they're resourceful. Our economy will grow again, but we just don't know exactly when we'll get back to where we wanna be. And so it calls on all of us to have a sharing attitude through the troubles. Mm. Wow, Paul, you, you didn't disappoint. Uh, in a short period of time, you packed so much in there, and I'm really glad that we're recording this so that people, we can all go back and, and listen to it because there's just so much there that I think we really need to spend some time on uh, in the coming weeks, and I want to I thank you for that. Um, N.T. Wright, in his book on the pandemic, says that the, when it comes to the economic challenge, he says that perhaps there's an opportunity here for, for new leadership and a new way forward if we're, if we're bold enough to grasp it. And I heard some of that. In what, you were, in what you were saying, that rather than just trying to ride it out, perhaps there's a way that we can grapple with this and actually make some, some lasting changes that are really going to uh, benefit, uh, benefit us all. So uh, I, I really thank you for taking the time to unpack this for us and share your expertise. Sure. Uh, I know it's been a really valuable exercise, so thank you very much. You're welcome. If you found what Paul had to say sobering, you're not alone. There's a lot there that we have to process and come to terms with. But let's think about it for a second. Because the reality of what we're facing poses a question. Do we have to ex simply accept this as unavoidable? As something that we just have to put up with and, and embrace because there's really nothing that we can do about it? Or do we approach this as an opportunity for us to actually do some things differently? to make some changes in the way we as individuals and as families and households and even we as a church respond to the economic needs of our time. In the book of Acts, there's a story about a similar such thing. It's found in Acts chapter 11. And in the story, the Christians at Antioch were approached by the prophet Agabus who warned that there was a coming world famine. And it's so interesting to see how they responded. In Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman Empire. This happened during the reign of Claudius. Listen to this. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So when they heard the prophetic announcement that there was going to be a global famine, that there was going to be a global crisis, how did they respond? They got together, they talked about it, and they said, what can we do and how can we help? They knew that whatever they could do, each in their own ability, they needed to do something. And so they mobilized, they prepared, they decided they would send Paul and Barnabas with the help that they were able to gather to Jerusalem to help with the famine. This is a great example of how we, as the body of Christ, can respond to the crisis that is ahead of us. Rather than throwing up our hands, or rather than turning our backs, or rather than ignoring it altogether, we can come together as a people and say, what can we do? How can we help? And how do we mobilize in order to meet the need? This is an opportunity for the church to give leadership in a whole new way. I hope you'll join us next week when Carl Nash picks up this theme and talks about the kind of heart, the kind of character, and the kind of spirit that is called for in this age, as, an, as we have the opportunity to respond to this crisis as Christ followers. 
Let me pray for us to prepare our hearts. Father in heaven, um, nothing surprises you and nothing has taken you um, off of your throne. We know that and we trust in that. And we know that we can look to you. We know that we live in these unprecedented times and that there is trouble on the horizon. Trouble for many, trouble for many of our own brothers and sisters, many of our neighbors, many of our co-workers, many of our children and our grandchildren. And so, Lord, we ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would encourage us to have a spirit of helping. That we would come together as a people, come together as households, and that we would do everything that we can to help one another through this time. Oh, Father, let your glory be shown, be shown through your church at this time. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come and to lead us and to prepare us for the work ahead. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last number of weeks, we've been looking at Jeremiah 29 and how the people of Israel were exiled from their homeland to Babylonia and how they lost their homes, they lost their livelihoods, they lost their lives, and they had to restart in a brand new place. It's interesting that I've been reading in 1 Peter and I noticed that he uses the same word, the word exile. And so I started looking deeper into why he used that word. And the people of the early church, the new believers in Jesus Christ, they had been thrown all over the world. They'd had to flee from their homes um, because of persecution in their faith. And they'd lost their homes. They'd lost their livelihoods. They had lost um, everything that they had known. But the one thing that they had gained is a sense of identity, a sense of who they were, because they were this united group of people through Jesus Christ. And Peter actually says this. He says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And here's our purpose. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Peter repeatedly tells them, Watch how you behave. Watch how you represent God in the world where you live so that other people who don't know God can look at you and they will realize that you are the glory of God present in this world. And I realized how similar the situation was to us. We are thrown apart. We can't come together again. We haven't lost our livelihoods. Well, some of them, us may have. We lost, have, haven't lost our homeland but we have lost our community. We've lost our sense of being able to be in this space together. But the one thing that we haven't lost and we won't ever lose is the unity that we have in Christ. Because of what Christ has done for us, we have be called a people. We have a purpose and we have a place. Through Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, we have been unified. And so as you look at the cup and the bread this morning, think about what Christ has done for us to bring us together and think that he has given us not only a people to belong to, he's given us a purpose, and that is to be his glory in this world with all of the people that we may interact with. So as you are taking the bread, remember that it is a representation of Christ's body broken for you. And as you are taking of the cup, remember that it is Christ's blood poured out for you. And because of that, you have a people and you have a purpose and you have a place.
is a kingdom where the meek will have it all Where the humble sit in honor Feasting at the banquet hall Where the gates are wide with welcome The king is calling one and all To the table To the table There's a kingdom dawning in our hearts and homes Where the lonely find a family And the hopeless find a hope Where we lay aside our comfort To embrace a deeper call Danielle Strickland describes generosity, living open-handed in a closed fist culture. And generosity can take on so many different forms, our money and our resources, but also our time. And what about our, our words and how we encourage, how we show love to those around us? In this season, may we be people of generosity. And as we continue to sink our heartbeats with the heart of the Father, may we be people who lavish this love and peace and patience and goodness and kindness on those around us in whatever way we're set up to do that. We hope this week that you'll join us for FBCC Live on Facebook and Instagram. That's on Tuesday evening and on Thursday morning at Forest Brook CC. You can like and follow us. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful week. Go in peace. Thank you.